Thank you, Vajra Shira. Okie dokie. There you are. It feels a bit weird standing behind this, but there you go. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about compassion today. Karen R. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk about... You're supposed to do this thing in talks, aren't you? You're supposed to tell them what you're going to talk about. Say what you're going to say, then tell them what you told them. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Following that. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the Buddha. Um, and we're looking at compassion itself, but... I think particularly in the talk, I'm going to try and sort of keep in mind um, the Buddha, just because it, he's sort of the, you know, the absolute, uh, you know, manifestation of compassion. I'm going to talk about dukkha uh, and responses to suffering. And that's pretty much it. About a quarter of an hour. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so Buddhism sort of manifested um, in lot in a variety of kind of fascinating intriguing ways um, throughout history from, from, the, from the Buddha's enlightenment under the Bodhi tree up, up till now. So we've got all sorts of different kind of manifestations of, of the Dharma, all these, you know, like I say, kind of strange different periods in Buddhist history. We've got, uh, you know, the, I mean, if you just go down to the library on, uh, here at Padmaloka on Rose Alley, there's like, any book you pick up, there's going to be some crazy sort of fascinating aspect of the Dharma that, or some angle or you know, some manifestation of the path to the end of suffering that, that you probably haven't sort of come across or that will ring certain bells. So, you know, we've got this huge sort of colourful history. We've got the, the kind of playful, insane uh, stories of the Zen masters. We've got the kind of complex rituals and magic of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, the sort of beauty and vastness of the Mahayana Sutras, the weirdness of the perfection of wisdom Sutras. That's a personal thing. Um, <laughs> they're not weird, of course, although I don't understand them at all. Um, but I just want to, I want to look at one particular period in Buddhist history throughout all that sort of, uh, throughout all these different manifestations. There's one just very specific and quite short period that I find sort of intensely magical and beautiful and, um, and just sort of absolutely, un, absolutely unknowable in a way that, that for me, is, is, and I'm sure for many people, has, has always kind of stood out uh, as, as just com- utterly amazing. And um, yeah, I don't know what to say about it. It's just, it's just this unreal little, pist- uh, little period. And this is, of course, two and a half thousand years ago in northern India around the Ganges Valley. So in this period of time, we see the first um, fully enlightened being, specifically with the ability to turn to the world and effectively communicate the Dharma. Okay. So this might not have been the first time there was an enlightened being. You have this kind of, this idea of the Pracheka Buddhas who, um, you know, there's this idea that these sort of forest, someone who gains full enlightenment but just isn't able to actually turn and communicate it to, to others. So this is the first time we've got a fully enlightened being turning to the world and communicating the Dharma, communicating the path to Nirvana. So yeah, just, just this, this, I find this the most exciting, you know, utterly mysterious period in, in all of Buddhist history. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just kind of fascinating. Um, I mean, if, if you read uh, Bhikkhu Nyanamoli's Life of the Buddha, that's very interesting because it, 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 it's the Pali Canon, but he's kind of set it out in a chronological way, so you can pretty much read as chronologically... Chronologically a word? As chronologically as you can get it from sort of... Um, from the Buddha's enlightenment up to, his, up to his death. There's a whole period in the middle where they don't quite know what happened where. But, um, but, but looking at this, it's just, it's just absolutely amazing. And it, it really um, it gives a real sort of insight 
and really allows you to sort of touch kind of what happened at that period in time in history. Um, so seeing the Pali Canon kind of laid out in this way, it gives us an, a sort of insight into the magic and this kind of almost like this fire that was spreading through, through the, the Ganges Valley at the time, which was the Buddha and his disciples communicating the Dharma. Um, and you, you just get all sorts of absolutely like crazy sort of stories. I mean, it's really, it's really worth just, just going, if any of you, I'm sure a lot of you will have done, but if any of you haven't, just have a look at Nyana Moli's uh, Life of the Buddha. And it's particularly for me the period where he gains enlightenment to sort of, uh, I think it's called the first few years, the first two disciples, and there's a period of Anat- Anatapindika. And it's just on fire. You just get this sense of like, what the hell is happening here? You know, it's kind of like, and again, we've got we've got these sort of like the, you know like the wisdom uh, perfection of wisdom texts and you know all these kind of tantric vajrayana kind of texts. But if you go back to this period in Buddhist history, it's just like it just kind of leaves you just completely dumbstruck. So you have got all the, all these um, things happening. You have got him the Buddha kind of going back and communicating to his his uh, you know the wonderful story of him communicating to his former ascetic companions. You've got the f- wonderful story of Yasa and his family, you know, this, uh, the Buddha kind of meets this kind of, get the impression, sort of this young man who's, who's just uh, had enough of, of his life at the time. Uh, and the Buddha gets into communication with him. He gains enlightenment. And, and then there's this weird stuff happens where it's like his dad comes to look for him and becomes a disciple. And his mum does, or, or I can't work out exactly how it happens, but it's just this, this great, you know, the Buddha in kind of contact in the world, and it's just a, it's pretty crazy. You get this fascinating little story: a band of party goers have been gavorting in the forest and kind of letting loose, and uh, one of them's turned up without uh, without a female spouse, and uh, so they get him a prostitute. So this prostitute nicks his wallet or whatever they had in those times. Uh, so the Buddha comes across this kind of like this group of people. Trying to find this prostitute, saying, have you, have you seen this young woman she's stolen from us? And he kind of communicates with them. Uh, this w- amazing story of uh, the Karsipas, the matted hair ascetics, and all their followers, and how they sort of, t- you know, this period where, the, where one of them's almost like tussling with the Buddha. Um, the two chief disciples, Sokutra and Mogalana. And this, my favourite bit is uh, this sort of fervent enthusiasm of the merchant Anatapindika, it's absolutely unbelievable it's just kind of like this guy just he turns up to someone's house and if someone turns up to his house, that's it and uh, and Anat- Anat- no it can't be <laughs> Anatapindika basically hears of the Buddha and he's just, just the word, the Buddha he just kind of stops him in his tracks and he he um, he basically, you can see him almost just like spreading the word that the Buddha's coming in and, uh, and you, you know, he becomes a, a, a very sort of loyal disciple of the Buddha. Um, so yeah, just looking at this period, it's like there's obviously something like absolutely magical and fascinating, you know, spreading through, spreading through the region, through the countryside. And it's like that fire is, is the Buddha in, in contact with the world. It's a transcendental in contact with mundane conditioned existence and transforming mundane conditioned existence. Um, yeah, so it's just this period, this, this kind of first few years almost after the Buddha's enlightenment and his communication that, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the, abs- the, the most magical time we can sort of look at. And it's almost like, particularly looking at Nyana Moli's book, it, you can get a sense that um, looking at Buddhist history in this way, it can all look a bit tidy and a bit kind of sewn up and he gains enlightenment. Then speaks to the ascetics, he pronounces the Four Noble Truth. So they gain enlightenment, they kind of go off. And it's all nice and kind of tidy in, in a way. But, it's, um, but what actually happens, you know, it's like, well, first there's a, there's a kind of historical fact that we don't really know exactly what happened. 
And I'm sure, you know, it said that the Buddha probably didn't lay out the Four Noble Truths in this clear, concise way. Um, we don't really know what he taught, essentially, in the sort of early days. I think he was probably working out his Dharma, working out the kind of how it was going to manifest and seeing how it was affecting people. So we just, I just wanted to kind of make the point that, you know, it can look really tidy and sewn up. But when you've got the Buddha, fully enlightened Buddha, able to communicate the Dharma to all these people, you know, we've got to essentially say, well, we don't know what happened, actually. We don't know what enlightenment is. I don't. So what happened is just such a mystery. It's said that um, quite early in this period, it said that the Buddha actually managed to lead to insight 55 people from one village. Before long, he had 60 fully enlightened disciples. Um, the, Buddha, the Buddha gathers these 60 together and he sets them off to proclaim, proclaim the Dharma to, that's going to lead to the end of suffering. And he states that he doesn't want any, any two of his disciples to walk in the same direction. Because it's almost like he's seen how important the Dharma is. He's seen that people have been released from suffering, from hearing it. And that many more can be as well. So he doesn't want two of them to kind of traipse off, you know, kind of hanging out with each other. He wants them all to go in different directions. Because he knows what they've got to offer. And he, he, can, he knows how important, he can see how important it is. I kind of always wonder as well, you know... Um, I suppose the Buddha didn't really know if his teaching was going to work, which I find really interesting. It's kind of, when he decides to teach, I'm going to come back to that later, he doesn't know if it's going to work. There were probably quite a few people previous to that that decided to teach, but just couldn't. They just, they just couldn't communicate. They didn't have the, not the capacity, but they didn't have the means to be able to communicate the Dharma. So I find that fascinating. The Buddha just didn't know. It wasn't like, I found the truth and I'm going to tell everyone. You know, it's all kind of end of story. It's just sort of, uh, he just didn't know, which I, which I think is kind of fascinating. I also wonder what it would have looked like, these 60, enlight, 60 full enlightened disciples and the Buddha. Just visually now, it's like, what would that have looked like? Would they have looked similar to us? You know, would they be floating three feet in the ground? It's like, because you, you have, to have these images of what an enlightened being probably looks like. Uh, but we, yeah, we just don't know. They would have probably just looked like a, a just lo- they, they, they would have just looked like a load of, scruffy ascetics kind of just hanging out to be honest that's what I think but I don't know don't know so the question is like why did the Buddha set these 60 disciples off why, why did he say I don't want any two of you to go in the same direction you know he obviously thought about that it wasn't just like you know someone said oh, I want to go this way and someone said oh, I might try that way and he said oh, I've got an idea why don't you all go different ways there was a, there was a reason that he would have said, you know, I don't want any of you to go in the same direction. So why did the Buddha do this? Um, I mean, in a way, the Buddha wasn't interested in his disciples going off and attracting more and more disciples so he could be seen as, you know, uh, you know, Shakyamuni, the heavyweight, who's just got thousands of disciples, more than anyone else. He wasn't interested in that. He didn't want to be ranked as one of the spiritual leaders of the time. He wasn't interested in receiving riches for his teachings. He wasn't interested in uh, being given beautiful gardens by merchants. He wasn't interested with, in arguing with Brahmins and winning debates. He wasn't even interested in just sitting out, sitting away from the world, just absorbing himself in the release of Nirvana. That wasn't you could say that wasn't what he was interested in. So from a certain point of view, it's like, well, there was nothing within mundane existence that the Buddha was interested in. He'd completely severed his bonds of attachment to the world. And there was nothing that, you know, the world, conditioned existence, could actually offer the Buddha. To put it like that. Um, so where does this leave the Buddha in relationship to the rest of the world you know if he's kind of if he's sort of not interested Um, and the clear kind of direct answer to this question is found 
in his instructions to these first 60 disciples. So he wants them to go in different directions. And he, he, sell, he tells them to set off and teach his dharma. And this is the answer. For the welfare and happiness of many. Out of compassion for the world. So he's not interested in keeping all his disciples together. And then just, you know, hanging out, enjoying their enlightenment. He, he's, he's not bothered about that. He immediately dis, disperses his disciples. He disperses his followers. Uh, and that's what he is interested in. That was, I mean, I say interested, it's not quite the word when we're talking about the Buddha. Um, but, you know, just to kind of keep with that, with that phrase, that was, what, that was what was moving him. That was what he was interested in, was for others to hear the Dharma that led to the end of suffering. That was, that was it. That was what he was after. Um, so at first it said that the Buddha it's going back a little bit was reluctant to teach the Dharma after his enlightenment he said that it would vex him to try to communicate the absolute subtlety uh, on unfathomableness of his experience to others he just thought how, how would other people understand this He was so deep, he just could not see, you know, how, how beings would, would get his dharma. But after some kind of time and reflection, that you, you have the sense that the Buddha has a sort of change of heart. And he begins to see that not all beings are so securely trapped within the bonds of delusion. That some may be able to share in his realisation. And of course, this is where you have the... the um, the image of Brahma Sahampati sort of appearing to him and the, the idea that there's some lotuses sticking right out of the water about to blossom and there's some deeply entrenched in the mud. Um, so this is his, his kind of, you know, he has this sort of, this strong um, desire to, to go out and try and communicate for those um, with sort of little dust in their eyes, as it's put. Here the Buddha sets out to find his former ascetic companions. He, he decides to travel to Benaz, to the deer park, where his former ascetic com, uh, old companions are staying. Um, and it's at this point that, that we see the first flowering of compassion in the world. This, again, this is the point, this is the movement from him just sitting, experiencing enlightenment, whatever that is, to deciding to go, to setting off to search out these, these disciples. And I mean, just, I wasn't going to mention this, but just quickly, it's a bit like, um, it is such a mystery, the whole thing's such a mystery, because it's like, you know, these, these disciples, when they saw the Buddha coming, they said, oh, it's, uh, here comes Gotama, you know, El Slacker, because of course he'd stopped sort of like starving himself, stopped taking food, and they said, right, you know, let's not get up and, and give him the sort of uh, any reverence as we used to. We'll just sort of sit here and grumble amongst ourselves. And uh, but as the Buddha comes, they just independently of each other, they just kind of stand up because there's just something about him. There's something has changed that they respond to. Mysterious. So compassion is said to be when metta encounters suffering. So here we have the Buddha fresh from his enlightenment, dwelling in metta, in the perfection of metta, ma, maha, maitre. Dwelling on the possibility that others may be released from suffering on hearing his teaching. So, yet yeah, metta responding to suffering, full enlightenment turning to the world with the intention of ending suffering. And this was what the Buddha did for 45 years. After his enlightenment, he just responded to the world over and over again. He taught his Dharma. So he, was, he saw that he was able to give to humanity something that they could confidently 
and securely and wholly place their hearts on. Something lasting, permanent, deeply satisfying. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about dukkha. So we've got the uh, we've got the definition of compassion: metta meets suffering. So I'm going to talk a bit about dukkha, about what kind of suffering is, because uh, we've got to get a bit of an angle on suffering if we're going to uh, talk about compassion. So I mean, there's a huge. I'm not going to kind of. There's traditional lists of types of dukkha. I'm not really going to go into those, just to say that there's an infinite infinite variety of the different manifestations of dukkha more numerous than there are beings in existence so dukkha uh, translates as suffering but um, I'll probably be terming it as suffering in the talk here but I, I, personally, I personally find that sort of unsatisfactoriness is a little bit of a better uh, rendering than uh, suffering I think maybe I, I tend to find it, that talking about suffering it, it kind of it's almost like you have a sense that suffering is when things get really bad. You know, and you're really suffering, like, you know, something like grief or great illness or some deep loss. You kind of, kind of have a sense of, oh, that's suffering. But in, in a way, <clears throat> I think Dukkha is so deeply, finely woven into all of life uh, that, you know, to, for me to use the word suffering... It's kind of a bit, it just feels slightly kind of outweighed. Although I'm going to start using it in the talk. Um, but I find that unsatisfaction is just, just for me, just covers such a larger kind of more, more subtle sort of area of experience. It just kind of fits better. So I'll just have a quick look about what the Buddha had to say about suffering. So this, this, come, this is said to come from that quite vital first sermon to, he, to his former ascetics. Birth is dukkha, ageing is dukkha, sickness is dukkha, death is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are dukkha, association with what one dislikes is dukkha, separation from what one likes is dukkha, not to get what one wants is dukkha. In short, the five groups of, gra- the five groups of grasping which make up a person are dukkha. So I find that pretty heavy, really. That's kind of, he's not, it's almost like he's not messing about there. It's so, it's so beautiful. It's so kind of, it's so strong and uncompromising. And it, you have a sense that there's a real urgency in the Buddha's voice. You know, he's talking to, the, he's talking to these ascetics and he's, he's trying to communicate to them. He's trying to communicate to them their condition, their situation, what's actually going on. So he's not kind of, he's not kind of messing about, really. He's trying to show, you know, show his, com- his, his companions um, that they could have a much deeper understanding of what it actually is to be fettered to fixed self, fettered to conditioned existence. So he's absolutely laying it out. And you see him do this time and time and again. Um, it, it, yeah, in, in his life. I kind of think if I met the Buddha, I'd just probably think, <laughs> just panicking on the other way. He seems so uncompromising sometimes. So to have any sense of the Dharma and the need for the Dharma, um, I think you know, we've got to have a sense of well, what is Dukkha, some understanding of what is Dukkha. So the Buddha repeatedly said that he taught that there's suffering and there's a path leading to the end of suffering. So this is obviously found in, in, in the Four Noble Truths. So to be able to tread the path to insight means really understanding that mundane experience is essentially unsatisfactory. There can't be a real path leading from suffering, from unsatisfactory and unsatisfactoriness, if we don't see that there is unsatisfactoriness in the first place. To make significant progress means having some awareness that the things in our life that we really rely upon don't give us lasting, permanent, flawless satisfaction. 
they fall short and this causes us uh, anxiety and, and a, just an experience of, of dissatisfaction. I think it's quite important to have a sort of vivid, clear sense of this ourselves so that, it, you know, Ducker, the first noble truth, doesn't just become a teaching that we essentially just don't really accept. I mean, it's quite a strong teaching and, you know, that, that what the Buddha said to his first um, disciples, I mean, it's quite strong stuff. It's quite strong stuff. So what did the Buddha, I'm just going to have a little bit of a look at what did the Buddha mean by uh, all conditioned existence is suffering. I'll just, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about suffering so that we can get a sense of responses to suffering. Uh, so, so what did the Buddha mean by all conditioned existence is suffering? So I'm just going to look at a few questions. I don't, I'm not going to answer this because uh, obviously I can't answer it for you. No one can. But I'm just going to kind of have a look at a few sort of questions to get different angle, angles on Dukkha. So the Buddha said that all conditioned existence is suffering. So does this mean that when we feel happy and well, that we just aren't looking deeply enough to realise that we're just depressed and miserable underneath it all? And I was wondering, what's the relationship between unsatisfactoriness and times when we feel really well and happy? and engage with life and wholesome so does Ducker just lurk in the dark corners when you're a bit bummed out oh yeah life's Ducker you know where is I was walking down I was walking down the road the other day and uh, I just spoke to my sister she was telling me about my dad and something that was going on in his life Um which I was really pleased about. I was, I was really sort of happy for him. Um, and I felt, and my sister seemed really well. And I felt, and after the conversation, after hearing my dad was really well, uh, and he, he, he said that he's got a crush on someone at the moment. So I was really kind of, I thought, uh, you know, I was really pleased about that. My mum died about two years ago. So was, my, sister was a bit, my sister was a bit careful about telling me this. He said, oh, he's got a crush on someone. And she seemed, seemed really well. And, uh, and I finished a phone call and I was kind of walking along and, and I felt really well. I felt really happy for my dad. I was really happy that my sister was well. And uh, I mean, I really kind of felt it and I felt really well myself. I felt really well. I was just like, brilliant. And I was kind of wondering, well, where's the ducker here? Where is it? I feel really well. I feel immovable right now. But then if the phone went again and my, dad, uh, my sister said, your dad's just broken his leg. It'd be like, shit. <laughs> you know, it immediately kind of changes. So it's kind of looking, it's trying to unpack, well, what is dukkha? What is unsatisfactoriness? Where does it lurk within different experience? You know, can we really say to be dissatisfied when we've got everything we want? So dukkha isn't like, you know, it's good just to have more than a two-dimensional awareness of it. Because I think I can have a sense that, you know, uh, oh yeah, life's stuck here when I'm not getting what I want and things are a bit painful. But it's so much finer than that and it's, it's kind of so finely woven into all of experience. Um, so there's no, like I said, there's no stock answers to these kind of questions about, you know, what is Ducker and stuff. There's, I mean, we could rattle off stock Buddhist answers right now that, you know, well, everything's impermanent, therefore it's painful. And... Um, but we've got to find out for ourselves, well, where, what is Dukkha? What is it? Uh, I think we need to develop a broad understanding of our, in, of our individual relationship to, the first, to this first noble tooth. Um, it, you know, if we're going to make any progress whatsoever. And I suppose the first thing is, are you able to accept it? Because you shouldn't just accept it because, you know, the, the, the Buddha always said this. You know, don't just accept it because he says so. And, you know, what is your relationship to it? And I think we can agree with a lot of Buddhist teachings, you know, almost most of them, but this one. It's kind of like we can cherry pick a bit and keep avoiding this central 
central teaching. So I think we just need to be a bit careful about that, and uh, and you know just be a, just try. You know, if you start moving on, your practice starts getting a bit deep, and you start you know you notice that your meta practice is beginning to bite, and it's affecting your response to other people. I'm not saying you know get all bummed out about dukkha, but it's like well just that you know use that as a momentum to kind of explore dukkha with as well. Is that an answer? I said I wasn't going to answer it, but no, no it's not. <laughs> it's a reflection. Um, yeah, so if compassion is a response to suffering, um, yeah, well, we can't be compassionate if we don't aren't in relationship with this first noble truth, with, with the truth of Dukkha. You know, how can we? Um, so we're putting limits on our metta and therefore our compassion uh, if we're not able to, to sort of experience, get, get behind this, this, uh, this teaching. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about com- compassion or karana. So what would karana, um, you know, what would it look like? That's quite a question. What does the manifestation of compassion look like? <clears throat> I've got an answer for this one. <laughs> uh, we can go right back to the, if we want to have a sense or get an angle on, well, what does compassion look like? We just can go right back to the Buddha, right back to the Pali Canon, reflect on the Buddha to see, you know, uh, to see what, what it would look like. I think, I think reflecting on the sort of life of the Buddha and the stories from the Buddha gives us very strong insights into what happens, what actually happens when metta meets suffering. What actually happens? There's so many stories in the life of the Buddha about the Buddha responding to different people. We've got the, the Buddha meeting uh, Kisa Gotami. So this is this uh, distraught mother who's bereft and is dragging around the body of her recently dead baby. So Kisa Gotami's, you know, it's almost like she's lost it a bit. She's going around the village not accepting the fact that her child's died. Um, with this body asking people for, for <coughs> excuse me, asking people for help. Um, and she's, you know, she's just repeatedly dejected by the people in a, vid- in a village, kind of uh, telling her to sort of get gone. But she hears of the Buddha. Someone says, well, why don't you go and ask the Buddha? You know, there's this, uh, there's this sort of holy man on yonder hill, wherever it was. Uh, why don't you go and sort of ask him and see, see what he's got to say? So she goes to the Buddha and she asks, she's asking for medicine. That's why she's been going around the village. She's asking for medicine. And, um, oh, seven minutes past 11 already. Uh. She's asking for medicine. And, um, and the Buddha, is, she says to the Buddha, have you got any medicine for my, for my child? And the Buddha says, the Buddha replies that, yes, I can help you. He says, I can help you. So she's kind of like, you know, just can't believe it. So he says... You, you probably, I'm sure many of you have heard the story, but it, it's, it gives a, it's a nice indication of, uh, of Karana on, on a certain level. So, she, uh, so the Buddha asked her to go and fetch some, to make this medicine, fetch some mustard seeds from a house that has not seen any death. So she goes into the village. She, she kind of has a, you know, she goes, she's going to each house, each hut, rather, each family and asking for, um, you know, mustard seeds. And sometimes she'll get some and she'll kind of say, oh, has anyone died here? And she keeps asking this question and the answer's always, well, yes, someone has. And eventually someone says to her, the living are few, but the dead are many. Do not remind us of our grief. So with this, she just realises, she, she just realises that with these words, that, um, yeah, that, that suffering is everywhere. That it's not just her that is suffering that everyone she's been to, she's witnessed, you know, this, this, this kind of pain, grief all around her. 
And she, she of course, becomes a disciple of the Buddha, returns to the Buddha and um, gives her child up. The, and, but, you know, that's, that's one... I mean, in a way, I've got to say, it's quite an obvious sort of a story. There's all sorts of stories. Though. You've then got the, the Brahmin Pachanika, or contradictor, who decides to go and refute whatever the Buddha says. You know, he thinks, oh, is this holy man? thinks he knows it all. I'll just disagree with everything he says. So he walks up to the Buddha. The Buddha's uh, teaching, he walks up to him. And before contradictors even opened his mouth, the Buddha's verbally cut him to pieces before he can even get a word in. So you, get, you can sort of imagine this kind of cocky sort of Brahmin kind of going up and having a go. And, and then the Buddha just giving him his lion's so It's like, <clears throat> he's kind of staggers back. So again, this is a different manifestation of, of, of compassion. It's like, you know, he's, he's completely sort of cut through this guy's limitations. He's got, bang, he's got right down to it. And this is his, uh, and this time and again is happening uh, with the Buddha, you know, when he had this ability to communicate to people. Sometimes it'd be this lion's roar. Sometimes it'd be, you know, in debate. Sometimes it'd be a very kind, affectionate response. All with the intention, always with the intention of ending suffering. So this is a vital aspect of Kaunar, is that compassion is an intention. It's an intention experienced from metta to stop perceived suffering. So compassion isn't a feeling. There may well be feelings associated with it. But the actual central experience is the intention to stop or reduce the suffering that's perceived. The desire, the will to stop suffering. And I think it's good to be clear about this, to separate uh, feeling from intention. So we can have um, an insight into this through the Metta Bhavna, in a way. Um, So the Metta Bhavna is a practice to develop a desire that beings be well, happy and free from suffering. It's not a practice to develop warm, fluffy, nice feelings that will guard us against suffering, that will guard us against the ills of the world. That will, you know, we don't do the metabolism to keep Ducker out. We do the metabolism to develop intention that others and ourselves be well. Of course, the outcome is that we can sometimes have nice, warm, fluffy feelings. Uh, as well as lots of other much deeper <laughs> experiences. But that's not what we're trying to develop. The, you know, the feeling isn't that important in a way. And you can see this with people like coming to the Dharma and, and, and learning about the Metta Bhavna and you know, they sit down doing it and they say, oh, nothing's happening, I'm not really feeling anything. You know, I just don't feel this kind of, I don't feel, I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling the love. And it's kind of like, you just have a, but they've noticed, I said, well, you, know, you can ask them, well, what's your, what else is happening in your life? Oh, well, I'm opening doors for more people. You know, I've noticed I started making tea for people at work. I don't hate my boss anymore. I made friends with my worst enemy. You know, so it's, it's, but it, it, we, we often kind of think, it's a feeling that's important. I'm not feeling it in the practice. What are you doing in the practice? Whether it feels good or bad, this doesn't matter. It's, a, you know, it's the intention. It's the intention. Similarly with compassion, it's the desire for others' happiness when they're suffering. And this desire will, will often, often manifest in action. The Buddha spent 45 years after his enlightenment ending suffering, acting, responding to people, teaching. So you can get, a, you can get we can have a sense right now of, of, of this kind of responsiveness of suffering, of, a, of compassion. In everyday examples, it's like if you see an old person stagger to the floor in the street, well, you wouldn't stop to think, well, how do I feel about this? He looks in a pretty bad way. I'm not feeling it, though. Oh, I feel a bit upset. I'm kind of going to get out of it. You know? It's like you see a... You just respond. You just respond. You see a child separated from its mum in a shopping store or in the street somewhere, what would you do? You know, you wouldn't stop to contact how you feel about it, would you? 
That just doesn't come into it. You just act. So there's just the welfare of the person, people you're responding to. Yeah, that's compassion. Just wanted to talk, mention briefly, uh, this it came into my head that, in a way, that the, uh, the Karen Artos, the charity, I'm not doing advertisement here, but I've, I've, I've just been looking at what they're, we're doing an India, India pilgrimage next year, and I wanted to kind of look at what they do a bit. And also my... <laughs> My girlfriend's a solo fundraiser. I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> My girlfriend's a, a solo fundraiser. But I've just had a bit of contact with what Kauna actually do. And I've, I've been really impressed. It's like, so Kauna's a charity that responds to the, the should was a very low, uh, lowest caste um, in the Hindu um, society. So uh, it was a charity set up to, to help um, these people who are sort of in dire kind of need in a way. So what they do, what the Karen Artists do is, you know, they don't kind of, when it was set up, they didn't have people going around the slums in India feeling it all and going, oh, this is terrible. I really feel for you people. You know, what they did was they set up hostels, they set up schools, they set up, you know, classes, uh, small business initiatives. Um, a lot of work was, was sort of um, kind of self-empowerment, particularly sort of women's self-empowerment. So I found that really interesting in terms of, you know, it's just action. It's just action. You know, they didn't go around just kind of witnessing the suffering and seeing how they felt about it. They, they just responded. Again, it's advanced this wonderful description of um, after in his book Ambedkar and Buddhism um, about how Dr. Ambedkar, the, 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 the sort of Buddhist leader not long, weeks after he'd converted from the mass conversion of the then uh, ex-untouchables in India. Um, he died not long after doing this mass conversion. There were thousands and thousands of people, these new Buddhists who just didn't know what to do. They had, you know, this one man had led them and he died not long after they all converted. So Bhante, you know, Bhante just responded. He toured around lots of villages, towns in, it, uh, in, in this area. He gave speeches rousing these individuals to, you know, well, what was Ambedkar's vision? You can live that out right now. He showed people how to, you know, he showed them how to practice the Dharma. Ambedkar saw the Dharma was what was needed. He died. Bhante responded, showed them how to practice the Dharma. Funnily enough, Bhante said that there was almost something else acting through him at this point of his life when he was giving these lectures, which, which is interesting. I won't really say much about that. So I'm going to have a little bit look on a sort of more individual level about um, suffering and responses to it. And again, still exploring a bit about clarifying what is uh, carrying on. So we can often have, often have views about practice, um, about what certain practices should look like, you know, what Karana should look like, how would it manifest. And I think in a way, we can often, again, base that on, on sort of feelings. It's good to be clear, like this, with, with anything practicing the Dharma, it doesn't have to look a certain way. It doesn't have to be dressed up in particularly, particularly Karana. It doesn't have to be dressed up in particular feelings. So it doesn't have to be a particular look of concern on your face. It's about developing the right view of, the, of, 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 of responding to people. I think you can have a sense that people are sometimes deliberately trying to be compassionate. It doesn't kind of work. It's meta and there's suffering. Um, I've just got this image kept coming up of the face of compassion. And it was someone kind of going... This sort of like a horrified, sort of distraught look. And, uh, you know, because it's kind of feeling, it's got to look a certain way, you know, you've got to feel the pain to be able to respond to it. I mean, you just don't, as long as you're able to respond. Um, so it's not a motherly response, it's not a kind of fussing, fussing response. I think when you get this kind of fussiness around suffering, it almost says a bit more about ourselves and our individual anxieties around the situation and there's a sort of fussing and kind of trying to patch up the problem and 
get out of here as quick as you can. Um, it's clear intention to act for the welfare of the person in difficulty. Remember, I was in the community, uh, when, I think it was last year sometime. I think it was Sanga Keita was in bed. He was not very well. And I think he had a cold on, I'm not exactly sure. And I remember thinking, I didn't really feel for him. <laughs> I wasn't really feeling it. I was kind of like, he's in the room next door, he's not very well. But that was my response. I kind of just, I didn't really feel anything. I thought, oh, I'm going to make sure he's okay. And I kind of um, repeatedly, you know, made, just would check on him, make sure he's okay and did he need anything and stuff. I think that was fine. I don't think we have to kind of, I'm leaving the point here, I know. But I don't think we have to sort of particularly like, uh, you know, feel it as long as there's a response coming from the right place. And that example was, well, I wasn't really feeling it. But that, that some case, he wasn't very well. And I was worried about him. Wanted him I wanted him to be okay. I didn't want him to be... I wanted to sort of ease his suffering however I could. But it was just a little kind of check to make sure it was all right, get him a cup of tea, so on. So we don't have to kind of complicate it in a way. I think that's part of it. It's like, I have this sense that suffering's, uh, compassion's this big kind of thing and we've got to kind of act like other like Tesha and it's like, how do we do that? But it's just, uh, it's just acting. Don't, you know... Don't complicate it. So how can we develop Karana? Well, there's the obvious two ingredients, Dukkha and Metta. Um, so in terms of the Dukkha, we can only really respond to the amount of Dukkha that we're able to be in contact with. Um, we can't respond to the Dukkha that we're not aware of. Um, so the, the thing is to try and develop awareness of the dukkha around us in a way. Develop an awareness of the unsatisfactoriness that's kind of right under our noses within our own and others' experience. So we need awareness to kind of, to sort of unpick this unsatisfactoriness dukkha element. <coughs> so it's important to kind of start where you can get a bit of a foot in. You can get a bit of a sense of um, dukkha around you. So don't go for the big kind of, oh, well, maybe, you know, we're not all enlightened, therefore I must all be suffering and I'm going to respond to that, you know. Respond where you can get a foot in. You know, again, this is the example of, like, someone's in your community and you respond. But, um, but it's, yeah, it's developing awareness of, of the dukkha. Um, okay, I've just got a, a couple of readings here on this kind of line of developing awareness of Dukkha. So this is from a, a wonderful book, it's Patel Wimpshe, Word of My Perfect, Words of My Perfect Teacher. It's quite amazing. Um, so he's kind of talking about, he's talking about developing, he's talking about awareness, beginning to really look at where is the Dukkha, what is Dukkha, and looking for it. Um, so some of this is a bit, a little bit grisly, um, but it's almost like you get a sense that he's looking at something, he's seen something that's not been noticed, okay? So there's two separate reasons. When you start meditating on compassion, it is important to focus, fo- it is important to fo- focus first on suffering beings individually, one at a time. And only then to train yourself step by step until you can meditate on all beings as a whole. Otherwise your compassion will be vague and intellectual. It will not be the real thing. Reflect particularly on the suffering and hard... He's talking, obviously, uh, to the Tibetan sort of people at the time, just to clarify. Um, reflect, reflect particularly on the suffering and hardships of your own cattle, sheep, pack horses and other domestic animals. Me. We inflict all sorts of barbarity on such creatures comparable to the torments of hell we pierce their noses castrate them pull out the hair and bleed pull out their hair and bleed them alive not even for a moment do we consider that these animals might be suffering if we think about it carefully the trouble is that we have not cultivated compassion think about it carefully right now 
Were someone to pull out a single strand of your hair, you would cry out in pain. You would not put up with it at all. Yet we twist out all the long belly hairs of our yaks, leaving a red wheel of bare flesh behind. And from there, and from where each hair was growing, a drop of blood begins to flow. Although the beast is grunting with pain, it never crosses our minds at its suffering. He said that the soft belly hairs of yaks, they, they would um, be used as wool and they, they, they wouldn't cut it out, they'd just pull it right out by the, by the roots. Just one more. Imagine yourself as an old yak. Your back weighed down with a load far too heavy. A rope pulling you by the nostrils and your flank, flanks whipped. Your ribs bruised by the stirrups. In front, behind and on both sides. You feel only burning pain. Without a second's rest, you go up long slopes, down steep descents. You cross wide rivers and broad plains. With no chance to swallow even a mouthful of food, you are driven on against your will from the early dawn until late in the evening when the last glimmers of the setting sun have disappeared. So I have a real sense with Petal Wimpshaw that he's, he's really seen with awareness. He's seen something that's happening all the time that no one else has clocked. So I, I was really inspired by that, you know, this kind of, this, 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 this awareness of suffering, you know, that there's certain things that we just take for granted as the way life is. Um, but it's just really beginning to sort of look further. And we, you know, we can do, that, we can do this sort of all the time. Um, so this sort of developing awareness of suffering, it, I mean, in a way, it's, uh, it's primarily it's just developing awareness of other beings, actually. It's not quite right to term it as I am in terms of just developing um, awareness of suffering. There's just awareness of others. If all conditioned existence is suffering, then there's just awareness of others. People's lives when not enlightened are bound up with unsatisfactoriness. Dis so dissatisfaction and ignorance go hand in hand. So all we're, we're really doing is looking deeply more deeply into the human situation. And you can do this at any time. Um, I remember walking through Nottingham and I was just, I was kind of, you know, I suppose I was in a, feeling quite a lot, experiencing matter towards the people I was seeing. And there's one street in Nottingham called Clumber Street and it's supposed to be the most densely populated street in all of Europe. So it's, there's this one kind of road that leads from one shopping centre to the other, pretty much. Where there's just lots of people kind of walking along. And I was walking down there, just, you know, with Meta, and just, and just started looking at people. And what I started, this was, so I wasn't, I wasn't looking with compassion, because you can't do that. I was just looking with Meta, and what I started seeing was that no one really wanted to be in town, really. No one really wanted to be there. And I could see, like, again, this is awareness and meta, just a different, just the people's life stories etched on their faces. There were some of you know, you know, just, they just looked, so many people just looked tired um, and not satisfied. But you could see these individual lives, some hard-faced people, some heavy people. You know, mothers with kids who were just tired. So the more you look with metta, the more you can kind of contact, you can kind of contact suffering. But again, don't, you know, don't try and look for suffering. It's just, just look with awareness and metta. The more you look, the more you see. And in, yeah, in Victoria's shopping centre, similarly, it was, it's such a place that I kind of used to try and get in there and get out as quick as I could. It, you know, kind of, it made me shudder just to think about the place, but after a while, it, I'd start going in there and just trying to experience matter to people. And again, it was like you begin to see people, you begin to have a sense that essentially no one really wanted to be there. Who wants to be in the Victoria Centre on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> shopping? I mean, they kind of did, but, you know, it's only because there's, no, there's nothing else. What, you know, what else is there? 
Um, so, Bante makes a very interesting point that um, it's very good to be aware of the dissatisfaction around you. But you don't have to experience great suffering yourself to be in better relationship to it. I've, we've got the, you know, there's the example of the Buddha. Um, he was free from suffering, but he was more than anyone in absolute dynamic relationship to it. So Bhante says that people who suffer are not necessarily near, nearer to the realisation of the first Aryan truth of suffering than those who do not. One can indeed have insight into the truth of suffering while experiencing happiness, for example, whilst meditating. So we can also use imagination to develop awareness of dukkha. So you can see this is pretty much what Pato Wimshay is doing in that like, second reading. He's just thinking, well, what would it be like? These, you know, these pack horses, these animals. He's, he's obviously thought about this. He's seen it. And it's not just like, you know, there's a pack horse. It's got a heavy load. It looks a bit tired. He's obviously thought, what's it like for them? They get tired. They get kicked because they're kind of getting a bit tired. Then he's noticed they're not being fed. Another kind of way in to a meta respond to suffering is, is um, I heard a, it was actually Tejan Andad leading a meditation workshop a few, a few years ago on an international retreat. And he was doing the meta bhavana, he was asking as a way in to the meta bhavana, what's the heart's wish? And I found this really helpful. And he said, ask yourself that three times. So it's like, what's the heart's wish right now? Well, it might be uh, to be sitting a bit more comfortably. Or I wish you'd finish that talk. Or uh, whatever it is, you know. But then ask again, well, underneath that, what's the heart's wish? And whatever comes up, ask underneath that, what is it you really want? What is your heart's wish? So with that, you can really get a sense of, of um, what's getting in the way of being deeply satisfied. And you can apply this perspective to others. And I think this is part of what's going on with the kind of people in Nottingham are thinking, well, what's their heart's wish? What do people really want? And what they're doing isn't meeting that, you know. What do people really need in their lives? And you, you, through this, you can get a sense of what's getting in the way of what they need. I think this is... Um, I think this kind of looking at the heart's wish, it, it allows us to bring the goal to mind. It allows us to bring enlightenment to, to mind. You know, the absolute permanent end of, end of dukkha, you know. So genuine awareness of others, of dukkha, sorry, is, a, is an awareness of others. And I think really seeing, I mean, the Buddha really, really, really saw people, Okay. And that was because he was enlightened, that he really saw utterly the human situation. So I think to be more, the more aware of people we are, is to be, is to be more aware of enlightenment itself, to be more aware of what, what people need, what do people need. And we then get into dialogue with what, you know, the suffering that comes through not realising impermanence, the truth of impermanence. So, uh, just, just, um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more about um, in this area. So, there's having an awareness of our sphere of influence as well. Okay. So, I mentioned before about, you know, I've got this idea of the Bodhisattva of compassion up there and trying to kind of jump up and be a bit like that. But it's like, what's our sphere of influence in, in terms of responding to suffering? And it's having been confident that we've got a limit to our sphere of influence. Sometimes we can help. Sometimes we can alleviate suffering. Sometimes we can't. Certainly if you're kind of in communication with um, people that are sort of repeatedly, uh, and this happens, um, I certainly used to do this myself, um, people repeatedly falling into kind of habitual, unhelpful mental states. So you might have spent quite a lot of time kind of listening to people, taking them in, helping them, bringing perspectives that's going to be, going to kind of have them see things a different way, 
which they'll respond to. And it will help them. But the outcome isn't always, isn't always simple. In a way, your response to people you know, might appear quite ineffective. People are very complex. Conditionality is just so, so, so complex that sometimes there's, I think there's only so much we can do. And I think it's important by not putting a limit on it, but it's important to accept, um, you know, what is the appropriate response? Am I trying to do too much? So it's not helpful to kind of run around after people trying to sort out their problems and difficulties. <clears throat> 